we're seeing a lot of different things, so we just explore right now. And out of the class, I want to just get like a better sort of legal framework for what designs would even be possible and what wouldn't be. Okay. Person. Yeah, later in the quarter, the stress is already kind of pushing down. I'll talk about how to fix, transform that stress today. <laughs> Too much? So for lab report stuff, we will, I'll try in a few weeks talking a little bit more about how to actually write well, and we'll go through some case studies and examples, or not case studies, we'll go through some examples from um, like previous people's writing and try to dissect it and, and think about what could have been changed in writing and how to actually form an argument and how to, how to logically present results. Um, but we won't do it for a couple weeks because I want to hit it before we get into our formal reports. Okay, <clears throat> so let's talk about stress transformations. So yesterday, or yesterday, Friday, we had our stress body. So we said if I have some body, some unit cube of something, some directions on it, uh, X, Y, Z. I have stresses in different directions. I have nine stress components acting. So I have some stress that I can write out as a matrix. Stress in the X direction, stress in the Y direction, and in the Z direction. In the X, Y, X, Z, and Y, Z. And then based on a conservation of momentum around the body, I can say that this stress tensor has to be symmetric. So uh, these components are sigma y, x, sigma z, x, and sigma z, y. But I know that my sigma x, y has to be equal to my sigma y, x for any body, which means that if I have a body like this, and I have stresses acting on it. I know sigma x, y, sigma y, x. These have to be equal in order to keep this thing from spinning around in a circle. Uh, so now it, we're going to look at stress transformations. So uh, I talked, so stress in a body is a measure of, of the internal forces going on, kind of the atoms or grains or whatever pushing on each other. Uh, and when we measure it, we're measuring some of these individual stress components. But these stresses only exist in the coordinate system that we're measuring them in. So it's, it's useful to kind of think about stress as, as a physical quantity existing in the body that you're then measuring by looking at it in different coordinates. So for example, a really, a really simple example is if I have a cylinder that I'm stretching out and I have I say my coordinate system here is x, y, and I have some stress acting on it. I know my stress in the y direction is sigma. My stress in the x direction, let's put the second one there, is zero. And my stress in the x, y direction is zero in this coordinate system. But if I were to look at it in a different coordinate system and say my x is now in this direction and my y is in this direction, all of a sudden my x is my stress, uh, and then my y is zero, and my xy is still zero. So how do I come up with a general framework for changing this coordinate system and looking at this stress differently in different directions in a body? So this is what we'll call stress transformations.
Trans. Transformations. And the reason, the biggest reason why this is important, well, I guess there's two reasons. One is that failure in a material is generally directionally dependent. So uh, cracks in brittle materials will open in tension. In ductile materials, you have dislocations, sliding, and grain sliding that act in shear. So in a ductile material, you would want to find the direction of maximum shear. In a brittle material, you would want to find the direction of maximum tension. Um, in a soil, you would want to find the direction of maximum compression because <coughs> that's going to end up causing a causing a failure. In actually, probably shear, but shear and compression because uh, that's going to cause a slip band to form. So depending on exactly what material system you're looking at, it, it really matters what type of stress you're considering for failure. Uh, and later on in the quarter, we'll talk about plasticity and, and yield surfaces and, and how to kind of contextualize that uh, for different material systems. But now we're just going to talk about how to rotate stresses around. So, uh, oh, right. And the other reason this is important is because when you're making measurements, so like in the lab this week, we have strain gauges that are oriented in certain directions on a piece of material. So those strain gauges can only measure strain axially. So they only measure in one direction, and there's three strain gauges in a rosette, but that means you still only get three directions of strain, uh, which will show is enough for, I guess tomorrow I'll talk about strain gauges, will show is enough for calculating <coughs> all the strains in a body, just having those three, but you need to know how to rotate between them. Um, so stress transformations. So if I have a stressed body, say just some general shape with forces applied to it, and I want to see the stress at some point in the middle of the body, and I want to say, okay, well if I know the stress, if I know what the stress is in a certain coordinate system, and then I, I want to say, okay, well in that at that same coordinate, what about the stress in this orientation? What is now, so say I know my, my stress in one orientation, and now I want to know, let's underline this, I, I now want to know the stress in a rotated coordinate system, which I'm going to designate with a, a little asterisk there, uh, or asterisk, apostrophe, uh, whatever this thing is, I think apostrophe. Uh, so, the way that I'm going to do this, and this is the way you end up getting to Moore's circle, uh, is I'm going to take my body in my original coordinates and say on this surface there's some stress tension, so there's some y stress, some xy shear, some shear in different directions, Let's say x and y stress out x, uh, x, y, and I'm going to cut this thing open. So now I'm going to cut it at some angle, and I'm going to say now I have a new coordinate system that I want to look at. So I'm going to cut it at a new coordinate system theta on this coordinate system. I'm going to have on my new x and my new y direction. So I'm going to call this an x prime and a y prime direction, and along that cut face, I'm going to have my stress, I guess this is my x prime direction, and a new shear along this that I'm going to call my x prime y prime. I guess I could say x double prime here, but I'm, I'm just going to put a single one for the sake of not writing these things out a lot. So this is in two dimensions. Uh, now, if I want to figure out how this stress in the new coordinate system relates to my stress in the old coordinate system. I'm going to take a look. So this new cut surface has a has an area A. This cut surface on the bottom would have an A sine of theta. Yes, A sine theta. This cut surface would have an A cosine theta area, this whole surface. And what I want to do is take a sum of forces in the x and y direction along this stressed triangle. So I'm going to say sum of forces in the x direction. This has to be 0 because, again, our bodies aren't moving. Now, or sorry, in my x uh, prime direction. 
So I want to take a look at what the stresses are along that direction. So in that direction, I have my stress x prime times my area A. So that's the force acting in that direction. Uh, I have going downward uh, and going outward, downward and leftward, I have minus sigma x. This is the area that it's acting on, a cos theta. Uh, but then it's also not acting in that direction, so I also have to resolve it into that direction. So I have another cosine of theta to say now the stress in this rotated coordinate system direction, in the x prime direction, minus sigma x y, again times my area, which is a cos theta sine theta, because now it's pointing downward. Here I still have a minus, now the sigma y, a sine theta, uh, sine theta minus xy, a sine theta, cos theta. There we go. It's a big, long, ugly equation. I can repeat this again for my y direction. So now I would do something similar where I would say in the, in the new y prime direction, I have the sigma x prime, y prime acting. Uh, I can take this body again and cut it orthogonally to get the, the stress in the opposite direction. So I could say um, cut it this way to get my, my x prime, y prime, and then I would have a sigma y prime acting outward take the sum of all these, there's a whole bunch of algebra, a whole bunch of <coughs> stuff that I'm not actually going to show you here because it's not super important. Uh, if you want to go through the algebra, you're welcome to. Uh, but what we end up at is, do I want to use a new piece of paper? I want to use a new piece of paper. What we end up at, when we write all of this out, I'm just going to, let's do this. There we go. Cool. So now the stresses in the new rotated direction are my sigma x prime in my new direction, sigma x cosine squared of theta plus sigma y sine squared of theta plus 2 sigma x y sine theta cos theta. So that big long sum of forces kind of ends up being something like that when I move things around. My stress in the y direction, sigma x sine squared of theta, sigma y cos squared of theta minus 2 xy sine cosine sigma xy is now <coughs> sigma xy cos squared theta minus sine squared theta plus y minus sigma x sine cos. Cool. So we have these big long strain transformation equations. So, <laughs> which is real fun. So these are, if I take that stress triangle and I balance it out and I do a whole bunch of algebra, these are the equations that I end up at. So that means now if I have a stress body going in some, uh, oriented in some direction here, or I have sigma x, sigma y, x, y, uh, then if I want to look at that same, the stress at the same point in a new direction. Now my x, y, tau, <coughs> lots of arrows, my sigma x prime, sigma y prime, x prime, y prime, and this is now oriented at some angle theta relative to my original coordinate system. 
this, these equations I can use to directly transform between them. So this is somewhat tedious, but it's a way to go about this. There's another way to go about this, which is actually, yeah. Is there a reason in the difference in notation between the sigma x and sigma xx? Uh, here, no. <coughs> so really, I should be using the, the double subscript. I'm dropping it here because I'm working in 2D. I also tend to use sigma y for <coughs> the yield strength, which is why I like using the double notation. Uh, here, it means the same thing. I'm just drawing it in less with less symbols. Yeah, good question. Sorry, is this is this totally screwing people up because I'm not using double x's? Is that still fine? Okay, perfect. <laughs> Um, how well does this scale down, like uh, in terms of again microscopic memory like, systems, that sort of thing? Same thing. <coughs> stress is still stress. Um, yeah, the the mechanics at the micro and nanoscale is still mechanics at the micro and nanoscale. Generally, what changes is the materials. Until you're actually getting to like the atomistic scale, then you have interatomic potentials that kind of make things a little bit screwy. Um, but yeah, this is, it's a very mathematical framework for looking at uh, forces, internal forces in a body. So as long as you can kind of pretend it's a continuum, it works at any length scale. Gotcha. Thanks. Yeah. Good question. Yes? I was just kind of like, overall conceptually, when we're talking about rotating a theoretical element, and just kind of get a different result, right? Uh, yes. So we're saying there's, there's no change in, actual, in the actual stress in the body. Like, this is, if I have, say, my, my coffee cup and I'm, I'm bending it or twisting it, there's some stress there on the edge, and that stress is what it is regardless of how I'm looking at it, but when I'm quantifying it, I say, okay, what's the stress in this orientation, what's the stress in this orientation, if I said, or what's the stress in this, so, so I'm looking at the stress from different perspectives, but it's the same stress in the body. Yeah. Cool. <coughs> Other questions conceptually? Yes. Why did we split our element in half into a triangle? Uh, so that we could do a force balance on it. Okay. Uh, so like here, this is just so we could say, this is effectively looking at like these two stresses together, except in order to relate them directly together, I just related them as a triangle. So I have like this on one half of it and this on the other half of it. Yeah, it's just a convenient way to... But you cut out the angle you're trying to transform to? Yes. Uh, so this is that same... Uh, this is also that same theta. Sorry, theta, theta. Yes. The areas is that just a trigonometric identity that like a sine theta. Yeah. And this is just arbitrary. I'm calling this my a. I could call this a, and then this would be a tan or something. I can't do trig off the top of my head while talking. Yeah, but it's it's just a trig identity. How come there's one with cosine and one sine? Because I have sine equals opposite over. Hypotenuse cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. Always oh, okay. Yeah, so that's a sine. This is a cosine. Yeah, so this, this a is along that whole face. This sine is along this whole face. Yes. Are there any formulas in this class that you recommend us memorizing, like these or? Uh, I think for the midterm, I'll have it be like a one-page open notes. You can memorize things if you like. I would recommend memorizing concepts over formulas, which I don't, especially nowadays, don't think is super useful. If this was 40 years ago, uh, and we didn't have, or 10, 15 years ago, and we didn't have ready access to all of the information in the world in our pocket, it would be a different story. Yeah. But I think concepts are a lot more important to try to get a hold on. So hopefully I can mail some of those in. Cool. Um, so, 
This is one way of looking at stress transformations. There's another more mathematical way that I actually prefer, and that's a change of basis. So if you want to, in linear algebra, change a tensor from, or change a matrix from one coordinate system to another, you use what's known as a rotation matrix. So I'm just gonna do this in two dimensions. So if I, if I say I wanna rotate this stress <coughs> to this stress. So I have some stress x, x, y, uh, x, y, 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 and I wanna change this over to x prime, x prime, y prime, x prime, y prime, y prime. What I can do, so let's, let's call this change of basis, there we go. Uh, what I can do is use a rotation matrix. So I'm in 2D, I'm gonna define some rotation matrix R, which is going to be cosine of theta, negative sine of theta, sine of theta, cosine of theta, which you might be familiar with. Um, if, if you had taken linear algebra or run into, I don't know, anything where you had to rotate things before. Um, so you have this rotation matrix, which um, you can apply to a vector to rotate a vector from one space to another, or from one direction to another. If you want to change a matrix from one space to another, the way we do that is actually, I can take my stress here, um, and my rotated direction is my R rotation matrix transpose times sigma times the rotation matrix, which then is, I'm gonna call this um, C, S, S, C for sine and cosine, just so I can write this out a little bit faster. Uh, this is cosine, sine, negative sine, cosine, stress x, x, y, uh, x, y, y, sine, cosine, cosine, negative sine, sine, cosine. And if you actually went and multiplied all of this, if you multiplied these into there and then the result into there, you would actually end up back at this same set of relationships. So uh, I'm not gonna do it out in class just for the sake of saving time, but it ends up being mathematically the same thing. So this is where, this is a big part of the reason why we look at stresses in, in matrix form or in tensor form is so that we can do these sort of mathematical operations on them. Um, and it's kind of an easier way to, to represent stresses. Cool. Uh, how, on, on like a, maybe like a, I feel not so good, okay, and then really good about linear algebra. How many people feel not so good about linear algebra? Okay, how many people feel like okay about linear algebra? Cool. How many people feel like I really know linear algebra really well? Almost nobody. All right. <laughs> cool. Uh, it turns out linear algebra is super, super useful uh, in a whole bunch of different areas of engineering. So I would recommend at least keeping in the back of your mind that it's a useful skill to have. And I'm sure as you go through engineering classes, it'll come up in various contexts, this being one of them. Uh, cool. So the next strain transformation, stress transformation thing. Let's make sure we're not running out of time. Cool. Yes. Possible for somebody to get that door? I can like barely hear you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Is that one open too? Oh, are we good? Appreciate it. Cool. Thank you. Uh, not it, the math works the same. So, uh, if you wanted to rotate in three dimensions, actually, the rotation matrix for uh, say rotating around the x y axis for three dimensions, you would actually just have a zero one out mm -hmm. here, uh, which also makes it convenient because then you're not really changing much. You don't need to know for this class how to do it in three dimensions. Uh, for an advanced mechanics class, you might, but yeah, <coughs> this is or in composites. Composites for rotation is is super important because you're doing layups and we have anisotropic stiffnesses. 
So it's all, I think it's still all in two dimensions for the most part, but yeah. Cool. Other stuff before we keep going? Awesome. So if I take these same equations and I throw some trigonometric identities at them. Uh, so now we're going to talk about more circle. More circle which is a convenient visual way of representing these stress and strain transformations. Uh, and particularly what Moore's circle is useful for is finding principal stresses and principal stress directions, which we'll talk about once we get through Moore's circle. So the way to get to Moore's circle uh, is you start from all of these trig, uh, from, all, from all these stress transformation relationships, you throw some trig identities at them, and I am gonna say, now stress x prime is uh, one half x sigma y plus one half sigma x minus sigma y cosine two theta. So you're using a lot of basically double angle theorems. Uh, sigma x y sine of two theta. Uh, sigma x prime y prime is sigma x y cosine two theta minus one half uh, sigma x minus sigma y sine of two theta. So what we do to get to Moore's circle, so this is, these equations are the same equations as these ones above, just now with a double angle theorem thrown at them, which, um, cosine squared of theta is 1 uh, plus cosine 2 theta over 2 is one of your double angle idea identities uh, 2 sine theta cosine theta is sine of 2 theta identity um, so like those kinds of double angle theorems you basically throw these into those equations before you end up reducing this to that form uh, I'm not going to show it here. I have it written out in the notes, but you have you would take these over to one side, square them, uh, and then add it all together. And when you add these equations together, when you take these, square them, and add them all together, what you end up with is something of the form sigma x prime minus sigma x plus sigma y over 2 squared plus sigma x prime y prime squared is equal to sigma x minus sigma y over 2 squared plus sigma x y squared. So what this is, is the equation of a circle. So I have x minus c squared plus y squared is equal to r squared. So this, the way we end up at Moore's circle is by taking those transformation equations, manipulating them mathematically, and then turning it into something that's roughly the same, um, r the same form as the equation for a circle. So this circle now is called Moore's circle, and I'm going to take that and plot this out. So now I have a circle uh, I'm going to call my stress in the transformed coordinate here. I'm just going to call this my stress, axial stress, my shear stress in the transformed coordinate. I'm just going to call tau here. I'm switching these over for the sake of simplicity. This is equivalent to a tau. Uh, and now I have a circle. somewhere in space, where this is my center. Uh, I don't have anything added to the y, so it's on the axis, and I have some radius for that circle. So that radius is the square root of sigma x minus sigma y over 2 squared plus sigma xy squared. My center is sigma x plus sigma y 
over 2. And now from that, I can figure out, instead of using the long, ugly math equations to figure out transformations, I can just use geometry. So that's the advantage of doing this. So here I have a whole bunch of double angles. So actually in my Moore's theorem calculation, so say I have, um, now if I wanted to transform a stress to a new direction, so let's say I have at this point, this would be my original x and xy. This point, I would say this is my y and x, negative xy, I guess, where I'm drawing things down like that. So that's my coordinate in space. If I wanted to rotate now to a new direction, this is some angle 2 theta change between them. And I could say my new stress along that direction, my sigma x prime, sigma x prime, y prime, and sigma y prime, negative sigma x prime, y prime. Um, I can rotate my original thing by 2 theta and say, this is what those are along the points of that circle. And so now this is just excluding the principal stresses. This is, this is a convenient geometric way of visualizing that stress transformation. Why this is particularly useful is figuring out principal stresses. So, uh, oh, I should have done a polar river for this and I didn't. Uh, I'm gonna give you maybe a minute to try to remember what principal stresses are and give a definition to your neighbor. So maybe like 20 seconds of thinking, 40 seconds of talking. Go over there. Yeah. You, uh, if you look at the circle, then there's like a few points in Those are pretty similar to the stress growing. Like if you're looking at things, Okay, who wants to give a definition of principal stress? I know you're all very eager to. Yes? It is when the block is oriented in such a way that there's no shear and the stress in the x and y direction are stress in the x direction maximize the stress in the y direction. Yeah, perfect. That's exactly it. So, um, it turns out there is for any stress in a body, there's some orientation that we can rotate it to where there's only hydrostatic stress, where there's no stress in the x, y, and I guess the z direction. Uh, when we're looking at it in 2D, we're assuming zero. But um, so, yeah. So here, this is really nicely graphically represented. So if I rotate to a certain point along here, I have, I would have zero shear stress, and I would have my maximum. Uh, stress axial stress in one direction in the x direction so I would have I can say sigma 1 I'm going to designate as my principal stress and 0 and along here I would have sigma 2 and 0 so there's some direction where I can say I have sigma x 
x, y, x, y, y. And I can transform this into something that is sigma 1, sigma 2, and zeros in shear. So no shear, maximum uh, stress in the x direction, minimum stress in the y direction. Cool. And so that is very useful in terms of considering if I, if I want to figure out where my either maximum tension or maximum compression are in a body, I would need to look at my maxim or my principal stresses in that body. This is also useful um, because this means that, uh, I guess, well, th not this particularly, uh, more circle is also useful for visualizing maximum <coughs> shear stress in the body. So now, if I say, um, if, I, if I look at this in, a, in my visual representation, if my shear max principal stress is here, my minimum principal stress is here, this is a circle. So my maximum shear stress now would be at the top and bottom of that circle. Uh, that those points correspond to the average between these two principal stresses. So now I can say my maximum tau is just my principal stresses subtracted by each other um, divided by two. So it's basically the radius of this circle. So also, I guess, nope, still just the radius of the circle. So here, uh, my maximum shear stress is, is the radius of the circle going up, or in terms of shear, in terms of principal stress, max is just sigma one minus sigma two over two, which should be the same as my, as my radius for this body. Um, I can also find, so, uh, what else is useful for more circle? Notes. I'm not going to pull those up. I can also figure out what the angle is between a certain body and that principal, or between a certain stress and the principal stress direction uh, visually by looking here now. Uh, let's just bring this all the way out. Uh, I'm going to call this a 2 theta p. So the, the angle between the stress that I'm looking at and the direction of the principal stress. And that, I can say, is um, if I now draw a triangle, I can say that's the difference between the, the shear at that point and the x minus y over 2 at that point. And I can say the angle um, between there, uh, I can say tan of 2 theta p is my uh, shear stress, or sigma x, y, over uh, now this is sigma x minus sigma y over 2 and I'm just going to bring the 2 over to the top. So I can say now the direction, the angle between my maximum principal stress and uh, or between the angle between my uh, stress and my principal stress I can figure out using this relationship which I can pull pretty conveniently using geometry out of my Mohr's circle out of my Mohr's circle. There we go. So, this is again a very useful tool for looking at what stresses in are in different directions are, what stresses in different directions are in a body. Cool. And the, the design of the, um, like the design of, like, of like a point like kind of indicate whether it's like, in, like tension or compression? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So here, if I had, um, so let's say I had some uh, stress that was uh, negative one, or let's say positive one, 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 negative one, and one half, something like that. I could draw this out as a circle. I would put my x is positive 1, 1 half, my y is negative 1, 1 half, um, and I would get the points of my circle. 
I could find the midpoint of that and say my center is at zero and draw out a circle from there that would look something like this. So this would be my one, one half. I didn't draw that through. Let's pretend that these are actually here. <laughs> uh, this is now one minus one half minus one uh, minus one one half minus one half minus one one half. There we go. Are the corners of my circle that I can draw? So yes, positive. Uh, tension here, because we're calling tension our positive stress, uh, would be on this side. Compression would be on the other side of our axis. Cool. So there's uh, there's another way to figure out principal stresses using eigenvalues and eigenvectors, which I can talk about. We have about five minutes left. I can talk about that, or I can give a couple examples for Moore's circle to really hammer it in. Which would you guys prefer? Say examples, eigenvalues. No, no, no strong preference either way. Okay, let's let's do a couple examples just so we can really nail more circle in. Uh, so, a simple example. Uh, is if I have a state of pure shear on a body. So, example, pure shear. And so here, now I have some shear stress acting. Let's call this shear stress tau. So the stress in the body in this coordinate system that we're looking at, x, y, is zero, tau, tau, zero. And I want to figure out where I am. How I want to draw my Moore's circle, and I want to figure out what the principal stresses are from there. And then what the principal stress directions are from there. So I can draw this out. This is now my stress, uh, axial stress and shear stress. My points here are my tau and tau, tau and minus tau. There's no axial stress. Um, so I know if I take my center point, the center of the circle, sigma x plus sigma y over two is just zero. So my circle is centered at zero. Uh, my radius here, that big square root of sigma x minus sigma y over two squared plus uh, sigma xy squared. Uh, this is zero, this is tau, so my radius is still just tau, conveniently. So I have my circle centered at zero, radius tau. I know that this is now the maximum shear stress in the body, which makes sense. Uh, my principal stress now would be out here also at tau, uh, and my other principal stress is over here at negative tau. So my sigma 1 is a tau, my sigma 2 is a minus tau. And principal stresses, <coughs> sorry, in general, sigma 1 and 2, uh, I can take, are just now the center plus or minus the, the radius, which I could write out, but I'm not going to take the time. Um, the angle now between these principal stresses is this angle two theta here. So I can say that two theta is 90 degrees or my theta is 45 degrees. Let's say my theta principle because my direction to my, my principal axis. So what this looks like now is I can say there's some shear stress, ugh, there's some shear stresses on the body or <coughs> I can look at this from a different perspective and say this is actually an axial stress and a compressive stress going in at 45 degrees. So this is 45 degrees, this is a tau, this is a minus tau. I, that's probably redundant. I have the arrow and a negative. Uh, just 
this is this is compressive and that's tension. Um, ignore the the arrow negative doubling out. Cool. So that's a quick example of more circle. I have one minute left. <laughs> so are there any quick questions on that? Yeah. Is there a sign convention with which direction to change the, the principal angle? Like, is it counterclockwise positive or clockwise? For uh, what direction, like whether this is positive or that's positive? Good question. I here I'm taking clockwise as positive, but now that you ask it, I don't know if that's strictly the right way to do it. I feel like it also is, but a lot of the time people also have the positive tau as the downward direction, which would make it clockwise, which would make it counterclockwise. So now I don't know if I'm by having it upwards, having it clockwise is making it. Let me let me think about that, and I'll get back to you in the next lecture. Cool. All right. Other quick questions? Otherwise, I'll see you all tomorrow. Also, I have office hours today at eleven for anyone who's interested in coming.